Hi, I'm Mary Labbe and I'm Chair of the Department of Nutritional Sciences here at the University of Toronto. And I'm going to talk to you today about do we really know what's in the food we eat and how as a researchers we actually use this to help shape food policies in Canada with a real view to helping Canadians be healthier and that means preventing chronic diseases in Canada. So when I ask this question, why do we even care and why do we need to understand the food supply? So I'll take a step back. This slide is actually a slide that was released by the World Health Organization almost two years ago now. But what's important about this slide is if you look at this slide, you can see that the largest causes of, of death around the world are in these red bars, and that is non-communicable diseases. And the main risk factors for NCDs, we call them for short, are smoking, but unfortunately, well, fortunately now, very few Canadians are actually smoking. So the next biggest risk factor for chronic disease in Canada is unhealthy diets or physical activity. And I'm really going to focus on unhealthy diets. And you can see, not just in Canada, but around the world, these unhealthy diets are the biggest risk factor for chronic disease. And they're actually accounting for more than 70% of the deaths around the world. So why else do we have to understand the food supply? If we're going to have food policies in Canada, we really need to understand the food supply. And I've shown you a number of documents. These are covers from a number of important government reports, but they're the strategy to um, get rid of trans fats in our food supply, to lower the sodium levels in our food, to develop uh, guidance such as Canada's Food Guide, set up obesity strategies in the country. These are all very important strategies for healthy eating in Canada. But if we're going to talk about healthy eating, we have to understand what Canadians are eating. So um, another really fascinating thing, just this fall when um, Prime Minister Trudeau started for the first time actually publishing the mandate letters to the various ministers. And this happens to be the minister's uh, mandate letter to the Minister of Health. And why I thought this is really important to show you is if you actually look at the, these are the actual charge to the Minister of Health, what she has to do. Minister Philpott actually, under her public health mandate, has a lot of important things. First one being increasing vaccination rates in the country, but the next ones are all dealing with healthy eating. So in other words, restricting the um, unhealth marketing of unhealthy foods to children, foods and beverages to children, toughening our regulations to eliminate trans fats and sodium in foods, and also improving information that we have on food labels, for example, around sugars. So if we're going to implement, and the minister's going to implement these types of policies, they really need information on our food supply. And as researchers like myself at University of Toronto, we have a large food database, and this is, we call it FLIP. And FLIP sounds like a great name, but in, a, in scientific terms, it actually stands for Food Label Information Program. And this is actually a massive database of about 26,000 foods. And the students and some dietitians that we hired went up and down every aisle of four largest grocery store chains in Canada, and they collected every single food that has a nutrition facts table. And we, once we had those foods, we actually took pictures of every side of the food packages, and we built this massive database. And in that database, we have information, pictures on all the foods, so we can go back and look at them. But we've captured all the nutrition information that's on that nutrition facts table. We've captured all the claims that are on that foods. You can't see it very well in the bottom corner, but we captured all the ingredients that are on the food. So now when you put all that information together, we have this phenomenal resource that we can do research to really understand the food supply and ask some of these questions that I posed to you at the beginning of my talk. So once we have an idea of the food supply, we can start answering questions like, and, and these questions are ones that are really important for chronic disease prevention such as we want to monitor the food supply and we want to look at some of the food policies. And if I think of think examples of this for monitoring the food supply, well, how have sodium and trans levels changed over time? We've had some big initiatives in Canada to lower them, or how are we doing? And then more recently, last year, there's been a great big debate as Health Canada announced it was changing our nutrition labels in Canada. Should we have a line for added sugars? Many Canadians have called for that and we can have data to see what would happen. So I'll give you a couple of examples that I think really helps to illustrate what I'm talking about. So the first one I'm going to talk about is sodium in foods. So these two figures, and I'll walk you slowly, but 
we did a database we've collected our database since 2010 and we've collected it every three years and the analysis from 2010 said that 49% uh, of our food supply was still exceeding the upper levels that Health Canada set for their food supply. When we looked at that again in 2013, that the food supply had actually improved and now only 42%, so almost 10% fewer foods were now exceeding the target or the upper level that, that Health Canada had set. And now these other three other colors, the yellow, the blue, and the black, if you focus just on the black one, this where they, they've set these interim targets along the way, and the, the black one is actually how many foods are setting the most stringent target that they've set for 2016. And you can see in that three years, the food supply has also improved. So from 29% meeting that final 2016 target in 2010 to now by 2013, 34% were meeting it. And we hope that when we look next year, how they were doing in 2016, we'll see that this has continued to improve. When you actually, that's how the whole food supply is doing. We also can look at individual foods. And although you, I'm sorry, now you probably can't read it, but if you look at the upper bar, a number of food categories that are very, very major sources of sodium have actually improved in the last three years. So we can see some packaged bread products have, have lowered their sodium levels between 15 and 20 percent. Soups have gone down by nearly 20 percent. A number of other foods have made 15, 20, almost 30 percent reductions in their sodium level. We think that's fantastic. But when we look at the whole food supply, we also saw that 84% of the food supply still hasn't changed yet. So we obviously have in those next three, four years, some significant amount of work to do. But we can see that with this strategy, we've already had some significant reductions in sodium. Now, sodium only started a couple of years ago. But if you look at something like trans fat that we've been following, these are values that I've just pl plotted here from cookies. So trans fat, um, has really, we focused our efforts since the early mid 2000s. So in 2005, I chaired a working group to, to task force to reduce trans fats in our levels. And if we look at how, and I just happen to use cookies here, in 2005, 30, only 33% of the cookies that were on the market in Canada met the trans fat limit, limits that had been set up by the trans fat task force. And when we keep following it over time, you can see by when we looked at the data in 2013, now 94% of cookies on the Canadian marketplace are now meeting the trans fat limits, which is phenomenal, great news. So in other words, we've virtually gotten rid of most of the trans fats in our Canadian food supply. So this is what these types of databases can show, that we have this great big strategy, but are they actually working and are we having the, uh, the effects that we want to see? Okay, well now switching gears from trans, we're going to actually look at another question, and this time around sugar. We're going to ask a different question about sugar labeling policy. There was a, quite a debate that occurred in the last year or so in Canada as we were actually looking at how we're going to revise our nutritional labels that appear in all food packages. Health Canada came out with a proposal that now says that we should just label foods with total sugar levels rather than the amount of added sugars. And the question is, is that sufficient to help Canadian consumers choose healthier foods? And we can now use our food database to help answer this kind of question. Do Canadian consumers also need information about the amount of added sugars in the foods or is total sugars enough? And Health Canada came up with a number of recommendations in 2014 to really help consumers understand the amount of added sugars in foods. So they did a couple of things. They proposed putting all the sugar ingredients together after the word sugar so you wouldn't have to figure out that glucose and sucrose and corn syrups were all sugars. And they put it on the nutrition facts table. And number four, which is actually scratched out, they actually proposed adding an added sugar. So in other words, not the natural sugars that were already in foods, but telling consumers how much was added to their foods. Unfortunately, when they came out with their final regulations last proposal last summer, that fourth proposal has been dropped. So our question was, well, looking at our food supply, do we really need information about the added sugars? And Health Canada has an education campaign saying that if you have, look at any of the nutrients on the nutrition facts table, if it's less than 5%, it's a little, and if it's more than 15%, it's a lot. So this is how we give guidance to consumers. How do you understand that label? Now, in contrast, the US 
came out with their regulations just this past earlier this year and they have said yes we're going to provide American consumers with information about the amount of added sugars in their foods. So we looked and said well does it make a difference if we only just have total sugars in the Canadian food supply? And I won't present you all the data but if you say less than 15% are supposed to be the foods that are okay, they're not too high in sugar, we end up with all these types of foods here and you can see that you know here's a marshmallow fluff that's almost and it's listed as only 10% of sugar so that would look okay. Some of these fruit type roll-ups that are almost pure sugar um, that and in actual case the chocolate milk looks like it's got the highest amount of total sugars but half of those sugars or more are actually coming from the natural inherent sugars in the milk and yet this product actually looks the worst amongst this group. So I really think just putting total sugars on nutrition labels doesn't help Canadian consumers understand which are the foods that you really want to limit your intake that are really having a lot of added sugars. So that's another example of how we can use this food database. And the last example I'm going to give you, or second last example I'm going to give you today is what else can we use this data? Well, now we've got this massive database of the, all the nutrients, not just sodium, not just sugar, not just fats, but all the nutrients in foods. So how can we use it to help consumers? So we've developed the number of consumer tools and apps and they, they have to run on our databases. And this is an example if you actually want to go and do a search and look up Project Big Life and then look, we've got a number of calculators there, but here's one on sodium. And in five minutes, we ask you first your age and your gender and we don't, we don't have to tell anything about you, it's for your own use. And then you have about five minutes of questions and using our big massive database behind, we can then tell you based on how you answer those 15 questions, how much sodium are you getting each day? relative to what the recommendations are and here's someone who has uh, almost double the amount of sodium that we should be and that's probably very common in Canadians and then not only does it tell them how much it tells them where their main sources of sodium are coming from and in this case this individual most of their sodium is coming from eating at restaurants or outside the home so this is a really useful tool for consumers to be able to understand not only how too much sodium cannot be good for you but then how do you can actually do something to lower your sodium intakes and we developed this app a couple of years or excuse me this website a couple of years ago interestingly marketplace featured a big um, program on sodium in 2013 so three years ago but since that time our app has actually been used over 450,000 people that's a half a million people have actually now calculated their own sodium and it's not just Canadians um, consumers all around the world have now used this website to calculate their sodium intake. So this is another way how these data can not only help us as researchers but we hope help consumers to understand what's in their foods and actually to help them make better food choices. And now I said earlier that Health Canada decided not to put the added sugars on there on the new nutrition labels. Well guess what? We decided we'll go ahead and do it for consumers anyways. So last spring we developed an app and we call it One Sweet App. It's free. You can download it from iTunes and you can actually take your smartphone, scan a barcode and up will pop like on the right hand side. Here's a food. It'll tell you how much sugar is in that food and how much of total sugar and how much of it is added sugars. And in this case, nearly all of the sugar happens to be added sugar in this food source. Please go ahead, download it. It's free. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is now we know what's going on in Canada, we can actually say, well, how are we doing compared to the rest of the world? And I don't have a lot of data here, but I just have one slide um, showing that I'm also working with a number of countries in the Americas, and some of them are uh, low and medium income countries. They have used the work that we've done from sodium, and we've helped them to understand the sodium in their food supply. So when I talked about our flip data collection, we also have these smartphone apps that allow you to go into the stores to see how much sodium is there. Well this is, I've put together some data and this happens to be bread from this study and on the left on the far side is red. That's the target that we set for, the, for PAHO which is the Pan American Health Organization. So that's the World Health Organization's office for all of the Americas. We set a target, the red is the upper level and that's the a target for the maximum level of sodium that should be in a number of foods and then the yellow are the ideal target that we want to get to and you can see that in this happens to be about eight countries that I've presented the data here 
Many, most of the countries now have the average breads are below the targets that we're hoping they will meet by 2016. And a few of the countries are now reaching the yellow or the ideal targets. And you can see that, for example, Brazil is almost there now. So that says that using these types of databases, not only do we see how we're doing in Canada, we can use these tools to see how we're doing in other countries around the world and compare how we're doing with them. So that's the end of my brief talk about why databases are important. I'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge that we've received a lot of funds from a number of research granting agencies. I have a great research team of graduate students who've done, they've done all the work and I just get to talk to you about it today, and a number of research collaborators here at the University of Toronto and in many other universities around the world. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my talk today.